I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our final speaker this afternoon. Uh, this is Emma Williamson. Uh, <coughs> and I've got a very kind of expansive uh, intro here, but I suspect if I give you the entire intro, that will uh, steal some of her thunder. And I wouldn't wish to steal her thunder. Um, so, uh, Emma leads a very kind of innovative mental health service, uh, working with people in homeless hostels. Uh, and I will, without uh, too much dallying, let her tell you more about it. I'm going to try and talk without a microphone. Can people hear me okay? Because I'm, I haven't got three hands and I'm going to get a bit tied up otherwise. Um, so, as I was introduced, my name's Emma Williams and I'm a clinical psychologist that works at South London and Maudsley. And for the last three and a half years I've been working um, in a, quite an innovative pilot project, working with homelessness in partnership with the third sector homeless charity, Thames Reach, who, who run the hostels where my service is based, um, and Lambeth Council, who fund those services. Um, so it's a real um, integrated partnership uh, where we have um, full-time NHS clinical psychologists based inside the homeless hostels, living and working alongside um, the, the people um, that, that spend their life there. And I think the... The reasons that this project has been so important um, in terms of a movement to recognising some of the gaps in the work of homeless people is it's really trying to understand something about some of the complexity and that it's not just about throwing houses at people um, or resources, it's about thinking and about working with people and about finding where they're at and what's going to help them at that time. In Stuart, A Life Backwards, he says, homelessness, it's not about having a home, it's about something being seriously fucking wrong. And I think that's really important to bear in mind because I've worked with countless individuals that have repeatedly found accommodation and lost it, not been able to sustain it. Some have even been given their own flats and have been living on the streets. They've been rough sleeping whilst they have accommodation. So it's not just about a housing situation. Leading on from um, what Jackie was talking about, what we know is that there's really high levels of complex trauma, multiple complex trauma with individuals that have commonly experienced homelessness, um, and that then that's repeated throughout adult <coughs> life and the experience of homelessness in itself is very traumatic. The literature talks about individuals that are homeless in the UK, 60 to 70% consistently would meet a diagnosis of a personality disorder. High levels of mental health problems um, as well, comorbid as you'd expect. High levels of drug and alcohol use. Um, high levels of forensic history. Um, and a homeless person is nine times more likely to, to commit suicide than the general population. Um, and 42% would have attempted it compared to kind of 1.5 in the, in the general population. So in this room, the life expectancy was probably slightly higher than average, which currently stands at 81 years. <coughs> the life expectancy, um, as many of you might know, of a homeless person is 47. For a homeless woman, it's 43. And despite various attempts, I don't think we've quite got it right yet in terms of what we can do to help these individuals. because there continue to be multiple barriers to access and services. Services aren't working in a way that individuals um, that experience these problems can really make use of in a consistent way. Um, there continue to be really high levels of social exclusion and they continue to be seen as a client group that aren't ready to make use of therapy and they're non-engagers. Well, I think actually, I don't know whether that's a really helpful term because maybe it's us that are engaging with them in a way that they can make use. So I, the work that I'm going to talk about um, is some work creating psychologically informed environments, um, which is a new best practice initiative 
first proposed around 2010, so it's quite in its infancy, um, which is really about recognising the emotional trauma um, and that can accompany and precede individuals' experiences of homelessness um, and working with that. I'll, I'll just touch on this slide. I was thinking it might be useful to have put it later, actually. But the, the service that I'm working in was led by a really quite innovative commissioner in Lambeth who felt that something needed to be different. There were some changes in the way they were delivering homeless accommodations and some of the ring fencing of that service structure was changing. So she had a bit of pot of money that she could think creatively about how to apply. Um, and based on a service review of what was going on out there and a needs analysis, um, she was very interested um, at trying to develop a psychologically informed environment in Lambeth. And that was in 2010, just as the paper was coming out about theoretically, could this be something we should try, go forth and see what an environment could look like. So we are one of those pilot sites across the UK that have been trying to think, what, would, what is a pie, a psychologically informed environment? What would that look like? And does it work? Does it help? Is this um, adding anything um, to kind of end this revolving door homelessness? So clearly we, we are in an age of austerity as people have been talking about. There is a real problem with accommodation and the housing crisis. But I suppose what I'm suggesting today is that for the individuals that we're working with it's more than that. Um, and that actually um, a home can be a dangerous place for some people. A home hasn't been a safe place, it hasn't been a refuge, there haven't been people that support you and protect you in those environments and their early life experiences. Um, and so trying to put someone in, into something that has felt a really dangerous, threatening place, it might not be surprising that they're bouncing out and trying to, to go somewhere else, um, wanting stability and somewhere safe, but actually when getting in it, that doesn't feel stable and safe. Constantly abandoning, um, losing or destroying what they, at the other hand, really want. So, an area of literature that I find really helpful in understanding and making sense of this experience of really desperately wanting to have some stability in a home, but yet also not being able to make use of it when it is available. Um, draws on the work of Henry Ray um, and the borderline state of mind. He's talking here um, in sense of a metaphorical borderline state rather than a kind of a diagnostic um, classification. But it's really a metaphor um, to understand how certain individuals structure their mental space and relate to themselves and other people. Um, and that actually they find themselves in a continual claustrophobic, agoraphobic dilemma where there's no comfortable space between themselves and other people. And we can all have this to a certain extent. We might feel overwhelmed in a relationship at other times and then be feeling, oh, why has someone not been calling me? Or why haven't I seen them feeling abandoned and lost? And how we find a comfortable space between ourselves and others. Um, but some of the people that I work with have this at a real stream. Um, and they're either feeling terribly controlled, abused and intruded upon um, by people, or totally alone, abandoned, lost as if they don't exist, as if they're going to die. And that these extremes are unbearable, so there's no comfortable place. And in fact, they oscillate, sometimes at quite a, a rapid pace, um, between trying to find proximity and then moving away. For me, this links to some of the literature on disorganised attachment, actually, and just trying to find a comfortable space. Um, and then nothing quite feeling right. And so these individuals occupy the margins um, and try to make contact um, as well as destroy and need to move away from that. And it does, kind of touching on what we were saying earlier and, and what Jackie's been talking about, um, as well about some of this early experience. And Ray would talk about this kind of borderline state of mind having origins in, in some disruptions in that really early experience. And so the child wasn't able um, to 
slowly separate and develop a sense of its own mind and its own needs and its, uh, develop a separate psychic identity and, a rep and understand that that's different to the other. Um, there was a tearing, a disruption, a trauma um, that's left them actually not only having disrupted that attachment that might be a loss of a mother figure, for example, the primary <coughs> attachment figure, but also almost a losing a part of themselves because this can happen at a stage when um, they were a unit, there was a merging, they were um, in that phase from being part of the mother to slowly separating and becoming an individual in, the, in themselves. Um, and then they find um, that it's really difficult to get a sense of who they are at times. Um, they can have confusion in identity, difficulty with boundaries um, between themselves and others. Um, and for me, I think I can sometimes see this in some of the, the clinical contact that I have with individuals um, when there's real um, a lack of a coherent narrative, a real jumble, snapshots of memories. It feels very fragmented. Um, and that I would understand this as, as part of this difficulty with establishing a coherence. Um, you would often see then that individuals might use drugs and alcohol to kind of wrap a womb-like cocoon around themselves to help themselves manage um, the distance between themselves and other people. Um, and also to regulate emotions because we know from this disrupted early attachment it will affect the development of mentalising and emotion regulation um, and um, has strong um, organic correlates as well. Um, some of the neuroimaging literature that you were talking about, Jackie, as well, um, that we can see real changes in the development of the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system um, that links to some of these early experiences. And I think the, the borderline state of mind um, concept is also quite helpful when we're thinking about how we work um, as staff teams um, and as services. Do we find that we are um, repeating some of these dynamics actually? And are we um, offering services but then also not making them available? Um, are we putting up barriers? Um, are people too chaotic, too unwell to make use of services and so that there is some rejection there um, and that individuals aren't made, able to make use of, they're battered around between services so we're kind of in, intensifying that oscillation. So based on, on this understanding, um, we, we began the project in 2011 in Lambeth um, to try to see what a psychologically informed environment might look like. It was first um, developed by Johnson and Haig, who, based on the Royal College of Psychiatrists, um, moved to develop enabling environments. Um, they wanted to think about um, how could we hold in mind the emotional traumas um, that individuals have been through and try to support them. And they said that the definitive marker of a pie um, is simply that if asked why a unit is run in such and such a way, the staff will give an answer couched in terms of the emotional and psychological needs of the service users, rather than giving a more logistical, practical, rational answer, health and safety regulations, etc. So, theoretically, everything that goes on inside the environment could be informed by the psychological and emotional needs of the individuals that live there. So when we were beginning our partnership with um, Thames Reach and Lambeth Council um, and, and, and with the health service, I think it was important to, to bear in mind that the anxieties that change would bring up not only um, in the individuals we were trying to work with directly in the, the service users, but also um, the hostel itself, and actually using some of our understanding to think about how we were able to form a partnership. And could we make contact, or was it unbearable and we would have um, be feeling overwhelmed? So. We had to slowly establish a relationship with each other, find out about our differences and our cultures, um, develop a shared vision, have regular contact so that we could become integrated. 
in a way that we were hoping to help some of the people we were working with become a bit more integrated. And that, that was a slow process of building up trust um, and thinking about how you bring different organisations together across organisational boundaries um, and not trigger overwhelming claustrophobic anxieties in each other. Um, so I think it was quite a big thing um, for the hostel organisation. Uh, their committee says, right, you're having a load of psychologists coming in to, to go in your hostel and they're going to improve what you're doing. So I mean, that, I mean, there's an immediate kind of tension there with us being tasked with trying to make some change um, and an implicit criticism, or let quite explicit actually, <laughs> you're, not doing, you're not doing a good enough job, um, but maybe we need to think about doing something different. And, and so that was, we've been on a journey together to really find what each other's strengths and differences um, and to trust and develop and open up to each other um, and not feel um, too resistant. And I don't think we've always got it right, um, but that we're, we're slowly developing a shared way of working um, together, which um, is uh, benefiting all of us um, in terms of our understanding. Um, so, George Orwell speaks about really getting into the world of the individuals that we're living with. Um, to have a more intimate encounter, um, to really understand something. And I think that's what we were trying to do. So the most important aspect of this psychological approach for me is that we have um, an NHS psychologist based full-time on site in the homeless hostels. So they're available, familiar, flexible, we can be creative. And I think that's absolutely crucial, that it isn't... Um, an overwhelming, intense demand to access services that you need, but actually it can be slow and it can be flexible and that we can work on an individual basis. And, um, yeah, the, also, because we're based inside the hostel, another key factor um, of our service is that we have a remit to work with everyone. We don't have the usual <coughs> inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, it's a very open door policy, <coughs> actually, um, and that we will work with people when they have multiple complex mental health difficulties and they're struggling with drug and alcohol services. So we're not based on diagnosis. We would not see someone because they're currently using drug and alcohol. We might slowly try to work someone to being slightly less intoxicated. But if they can only come when they're a bit drunk, then they can just about sit on a chair. That might be a starting point. Um, and we would work towards um, trying to bear a little bit more contact slowly. And we also try to have some flexibility in our hours so that um, the in, we see that the drinker, people that drink will often be up early um, in the morning, so we'll have early hours. And some of the individuals that use drugs might wake up very late and then be up through the night, and so the psychologists will work into the evenings as well to try and be available and flexible. They might be around when people are cooking dinner, etc. So I see there's kind of four levels to our interventions. Um, we think about the container, the hostile environment, um, the brick mother, as Ray spoke about, that it's really important that we think about um, the setting that we're in, we think about um, the, the garden and the plants and the settings of the rooms, and if individual has a trauma history, does it matter where their bed is placed? Does it matter what, how, what their proximity is in the hostel? they feel more comfortable to have a room near the staff. Um, or we have a mixed hostel, so two-thirds men. How, what's that going to be like for an individual with, um, that's had domestic violence or sexual abuse? Um, how would they feel in that hostel? How can we support them? Is it safe for them to come at all? Um, so we spend a lot of time attending to the, hostel, to the environment that we live in. Um, and then we have work that's indirectly through the hostel team. Um, so that we work with the, the hostel staff um, who are often working with some of the most complex clients that we 
you might um, see men in that come into contact with mental services or even can't make contact with mental services, but are often given very little training or support. Um, and so the, lots of our work will be working together to offer training, support, consultation. We have case-based reflective practice sessions in the hostel facilitated by psychology, often um, an external, um, and we will develop guidelines together in terms of how we understand people and what uh, help them at this time. Um, we then might have brief, um, kind of everyday normal stuff about people being with people interactions, um, the informal, so that if Bob can't bear to um, come and talk to a psychologist that you're going to get in my head, Dr. Psycho, I'm commonly called, don't you, you're analysing me, no, don't look in my eyes, you know, okay, well, I'm a person that likes a cup of tea and I'm going to be having a cup of tea in the kitchen and I'm going to happen to know when that individual is going to be having their cup of tea and we'll get the conversation going and actually um, it can just be about something quite normal. And that can help slowly build up that trust. So that's where the on-site aspect's crucial for me, and the flexibility and availability um, to work. So we might go and walk the dog with somebody or garden. Um, we're available um, to, to support people when they need it. They might um, come at a particular time. Often I'll see that the first contact I have with somebody might be when they're in a crisis, when something terrible is happening, and that that's the time when they might then be available to talk and that might only be for a brief time but we've made some type of contact and they'll know that there's somebody there then when they might need it in the future and that's often been the beginning of a journey um, therapeutic work with the people that we work with um, and then we have individuals that can progress on to more formal um, treatment so we have individual work our model um, is quite psychodynamic in formulating we deliver attachment based treatments and mentalising, um, but we draw on a range of different models depending on what will suit the individual, what the evidence base might suggest might help, and um, we can work flexibly and creatively with that um, as well. Um, and we have um, a mentalising art based approach as well, which we found has been really helpful um, with some individuals that weren't <coughs> ready um, for more formal work, but that actually something about um, the flexibility and the openness of that space felt less threatening, having something else to focus on other than the intensity of the relationship um, has been helpful. That, For me, that's what, what walking the dog or having a cup of tea can also remove some of that intense feeling and to reduce the um, agoraphobic, the claustrophobic anxieties that can develop. Um, and that it also can help people that might not prioritise expressing themselves verbally um, and that some of that... Um, the visual expression can really help. Um, and our, all of our work is very much um, adapted and adjusted based on what people can bear at that moment. Um, using a mentalisation model, which is thinking about intentional mental states in, in ourselves and others, and recognising that we have minds and that they're different to each other. Um, that, that that model would think about what's our distance between ourselves and other people and that we can adapt, we can adjust that, it's a dimension. And so are there times when someone's kind of really withdrawn um, and uh, are not connecting with themselves um, and the room and the situation, are there things that we can help to ground them, to draw them into the room, to bring them a little bit closer, to raise the arousal level slightly so that we can have a bit of a contact if they're too cut off, but not tip it too much so that it's too overwhelming and, and the ability to mentalise shuts down. So how can we adapt our distance between self and other to slowly try and balance that feelings of claustrophobia or agoraphobia? <coughs> They're the range of models that approaches that we have um, in the hostel. I was going to talk a little bit about Tom so you could see how some of the the, um, the work that we're doing plays out. Um, how am I doing for time? I wasn't five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. I'll be quick. <laughs> um, so when we met Tom, he was um, a chap in his mid forties. He had been exposed to. Uh, terrible complex trauma throughout childhood, multiple experiences of physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, frightening caregivers. He'd been in situations um, of care and, and in the family home as well, um, and had horrific bullying as well whenever he was in school. 
um, and was told that he was not good enough and that he was a bad person. Um, and he really um, struggled with feeling that anybody could be safe or approachable. Um, as a result, he suffered severe anxiety, depression, and, and he'd also meet a diagnosis of, of borderline or emotionally unstable um, personality disorder. Um, and consequently, he had difficulties regulating his emotions. He either felt very overwhelmed by fear or was defensively aggressive. And he used alcohol to block out his past traumas. Um, he also had a history of self-harm, suicide attempts, and was a frequent attender at the local a &E department. Um, and in fact, he attended 64 times in one month, and on average was attending about 30 times a month to A&E before he came to us. Um, as a result of his difficult life experiences, he often exhibited challenging and chaotic behaviour. He had damaged property, he was well known to the local police, um, as bowed from most of London, um, and that um, he was alternating between hostel placements and rough sleeping in that kind of oscillating pattern that I was talking about earlier, and the spells in prison um, for over a decade. Um, and due to his challenging behaviour, he had been evicted from multiple hostels and served custodial sentences um, the last time for um, assaulting a fellow resident and staff. And before he came to our hostel, he had been known to the team the year before when he had come for one night to stay with us um, as a result of the severe weather emergency protocol, which is something that's activated in London when I believe we're going to have three, it's predicted we're going to have three days of so zero weather, I think, and then anyone on the streets um, can be found a place to stay in all sorts of places, schools, churches, shops, open up their doors and will allow the, a select number of people, they can say, we can accommodate two people to, to crash, so that just really to reduce the risk of people dying on the streets. And so it's a real kind of not that I was alive in the war, a wartime feeling of everyone getting stuck <laughs> in and uh, uh, just doing what they can to help in these extreme weathers. Um, and often the people on the streets um, are surprisingly very grateful that they, despite not wanting hostel accommodation sometimes, they will come in when it's really terrible weather. Um, but Tom uh, came, uh, found the situation quite overwhelming, got quite upset, smashed up the place, um, assaulted the staff and left. Um, and the staff were very uh, concerned and, and they were upset about how dare he not be grateful that we're giving him this space in the snow and we don't want him back and he won't be able to um, make use of this. They were very anxious about him coming back to stay with us. Um, and as uh, they felt they were right, they predict, as they predicted, he came and there was some difficulties and with the night staff he was quite threatening. He had to be excluded overnight um, in his first few days. Um, he was uh, quite aggressive to the staff and challenging. Um, he was fighting against the assertion of rules and boundaries um, and was easily feeling overtaxed and intruded upon, as in my understanding. So he was brought to reflective practice by one of the staff members so that we could develop a shared understanding and, and quite quickly through the discussion. Um, it, it became clear to the staff in, in kind of like a penny dropping moment that, that Tom was actually terrified that when he was being aggressive and threatening as they saw it, he was really scared. Um, and so when a six foot six guy is shouting at you, it is very threatening and scary. But actually if you think that someone's scared, you'll have a different conversation than if you think they're about to lump you on and they want to do you serious harm. So everyone's saying, don't you shout at me, you need to go out. Saying, what's wrong, why are you shouting? Immediately, something so small as that could help him think about, what, what, why am I shouting, what's wrong? Get in touch with some anxiety and um, help soothe him. Uh, as a result, we did see an increase in his ability to recognise anxiety and he started experiencing more panic attacks um, and felt he was having a heart attack. So he was going to the staff team asking them to call ambulances <laughs> quite a lot. Um, and so we did some work with the staff to practice some relaxation techniques. So whoever was around could just sit with him for a short while, do some breathing, and help him understand that um, it was anxiety um, that he was experiencing, that he was worried about things, rather than just <coughs> having a heart attack. Um, we did check that out with the doctor first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not having an ambulance, Tom. That's <laughs> 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 Um, yes, yeah, so uh, 
he, he began to settle actually and, and, his, and his ability to then sustain accommodation and stay for a little while meant that he was able to become a bit more curious about himself but also notice something about the people that were in his environment and the psychologists. So he began to... Am I out of time? Yeah. Oh no! Um, <laughs> Very quickly on Tom. Yeah, he um, he did settle. He became a bit curious about what went on in the art group. That felt the safest next step for him. Um, he then went on to eventually um, engage in some individual work, although it was for a couple of minutes here and a couple of minutes there um, at first. Um, Eventually, um, he could sustain um, full sessions with us, working on trying to recognise um, and manage some of his emotional experiences. Um, he stayed with us for 18 months and has now gone on to um, stay for a year in another project. Um, and this was someone that hadn't lived anywhere more than a couple of months in his whole adult life. Um, his A&E is significantly reduced, so he's now going a couple of times a month, but we're working on that as well, and he's just beginning to think about volunteering um, to really give him some structure and routine so he was bearing a lot more contact um, and engaging with him not only with others but with himself um, so that's what I'm going to have time for this is his future home so maybe he will be able to house himself and his mind um, and we got some good outcomes as well <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, so we've just got some funding um, to expand for a further three years um, and the aim is that we will get mainstream commissioning because this isn't a marginalised area, this is a need that should be mainstream and available to all. Um, I'm really uh, keen to make sure that we're getting the evidence base as well as doing this amazing work. We need to be working with commissioners, we need to find that money. There's plenty of money out there if you're making the right arguments and fighting for it and finding it and highlighting the needs that aren't being met. 